Hi, I'm Major Robert Brayton with the Civil Air Patrol. This is the aerial photography pre-flight video. This video helps the air crew understand each other's needs and what needs to be done in order to deliver the highest quality product for our customers. This video is for official use only. For the first part of this video, we need all hands on deck. We need the pilot, we need the observer, and of course we need the aerial photographer. We're going to discuss how the camera, or how we fly the mission, how the camera is set up, what to do in flight, what to do after the flight, and of course, then we'll have a short review. The air crew briefing. When we are in grid, the aerial photographer is the crew leader. He's the one that calls the shots. The quality is every bit as important as the quantity. It doesn't do us any good to go shoot a thousand pictures that aren't the highest quality because we, we need the quality as much as we need the quantity. We need to allow time after each run of the leg or after each sortie, we need some time to allow the aerial photographer to go and review the photos that he just shot on the back of the camera and make sure that we are delivering the, that highest quality standard. It is much better to turn around and have to refly one leg or one sortie than to have to get back to base and realize that we need to refly the entire mission. So there's no problem if we make a mistake just to go back, figure out what we did, and then reshoot it right there while we're still in the air. If we need to, it's okay also to pre-brief to pre each mission leg by leg, every shot if we need to. That, that way we can be sure that everybody understands what needs to be done and everybody can uh, participate in delivering the highest quality product. And of course we need to allow for contingencies. Things happen. We need to be flexible and, and think on our feet and make sure that we make the best decisions that we can. So we have several patterns that we fly and the well, while we're flying our patterns we're always at 90 knots, we're at 1200 feet above ground level and we're going to fly where we're about 1200 feet from our targets. So what by doing that we're shooting at about a 45 degree angle. That angle is best because then we are not so high that we're directly over the top. We're actually able to get the front of whatever the target is, but we're not so far away that the performance of the lens and the camera cause us to not get the highest quality shot. Our typical pattern that we will shoot will be the clover leaf. That will be four images, one from each of the uh, cardinal points of the compass. We'll come in as it shows on the diagram. We'll shoot one leg at, 20, at 1200 feet, 1200 feet AGL, and then do a, a, a 270 degree turn, shoot the next leg, another 270 degree turn, shoot the next leg, and then shoot the next leg. This gives us four angles of the target. Now if the target is not exactly due north, then we want to shoot the four sides of the target. So shoot the front, the side, the back, and the other side as square as possible. Another pattern that we will shoot from time to time, this is kind of rare, but every now and then we'll need a bird's eye. That means a directly overhead shot, so we can see the target from directly overhead. On this, of course, we'll fly directly over the top of the target, and then the pilot needs to bank the wing 45 degrees and then the aerial photographer will bank the camera another 45 degrees to give us that 90 degree straight down shot. Other patterns that we have for shooting areas, one would be a following a route. So it'd be a road or a river, a creek or a path. We'd be following a route and then shooting as we go and making a one huge long panorama of that target. Another would be possibly a grid. This would be if we're usually if we have a large scale disaster, 
we'll go shoot a grid where we're shooting a large area and then we can determine uh, a wide area damage that's been done to an area. That's the usual reason that we shoot these grids. Again, we're going to shoot at 1200 AGL, 1200 feet out, but we'll come into the grid flying east and west because that gives us the best lighting for shooting. So we'll come in either from the east or from the west, and then we'll fly that leg. And then if we're shooting 1200 AG, uh, feet out, then we'll do three times. So it'd be 3600 feet and then come back and fly the next leg going back inside of that grid and then a 1200 foot turn and then back again. And this gives us our overlap. So we're shooting all of the grids that we need to. It might be that you're not shooting 1200 feet. If it's a wide scale disaster, we might be shooting quarter mile or even half mile increments. But the rule is the same. And uh, we'll also, if we're shooting a larger area, then the aerial photographer may need to zoom out a little bit to cover a wider area. As we're shooting, we're going to try to achieve a 20% overlap. Because remember, we're shooting a really long panorama. So we'll take an image, allow the airplane to travel. And then when we get to, when we've traveled 80%, of that frame that we just shot, the aerial photographer is then going to shoot another image. So we get that 20% overlap frame to frame. The aerial photographer that is on your mission may or may not be an experienced pilot. He may not fly as much as the pilots do. And so he may not be as used to flying and bouncing around in the back of a small aircraft. So keep that in consideration. Also, as the aerial photographer shooting, he's constantly looking down at the back of the camera. He's constantly looking through the eyepiece. All these things will disorient the, the brain of anybody. Even experienced pilots have said that when they start to do the aerial photography, a lot of times they'll start feeling a little queasy. So you need to take that into consideration. If the aerial photographer does start to feel a little queasy, Right away, start flying level and as gently as possible. If it's really hot out, you may need to go to a higher altitude to cool off a little bit. And of course, always have your uh, upset bags ready to go, the Ziploc bags, so in case the worst does happen. Well, this concludes the first part of our video to brief the entire crew. The rest of the video is now dedicated to just the aerial photographer. Everybody's welcome to sit in and watch, but if, you, if the pilot and the observer need to go plan the mission, go ahead and do that now, and we'll continue with the aerial photographer. The first thing we need to do to set up the camera is to make sure we have charged batteries and a blank card to shoot on, blank memory card. So before we uh, want to start charging our batteries, let's go ahead and format the card. So of course we'll turn the camera on, we'll press the format button which is the uh, matrix metering button on top here, and then we'll press the other format which is the trash can that's on the back. Press and hold those simultaneously for two seconds, and then the LCD readout will say four, and that's letting you know it's ready to format, and then all you have to do is press those two buttons again, and then it will begin to format the card in the camera. Now we want to be sure to format the card in the camera because that way the format that the camera computer that's inside the camera is writing, it knows how to interpret that. If we format it somewhere else, the other application or other device may have a different way of formatting it that is not as easily understood by the camera. So what we always want to be sure and format in the camera. There it goes. The next thing that we want to do is be sure to set up our camera for a sunny day, if it's sunny or cloudy or if it's dark. So what we want to do is to uh, put our camera into, let me take the hood off there. We want to put our camera into shutter priority. On this camera, uh, it, you need, there's a dial on the top here and we just set that to S. You may need to press a button in the middle there to, in order to get that to turn. On other cameras, 
there will be just four buttons here on top. What you'll want to do is press the mode button and then turn the thumb wheel until it gets to the S, the shutter priority. We also then want to set our shutter speed and we'll do that by activating the camera by uh, halfway depressing the shutter release and then using the thumb wheel in order to set the shutter speed to at least 500th of a second. You can go as high as 800th of a second if it's really sunny and you want to be sure and get absolutely no motion blur, but 500th is usually uh, sufficient. We want to set our ISO, and the ISO button on this camera here is, is on the back. We'll press and hold that, and then look at the LCD display and dial in uh, 400 using, again, the thumb wheel. And then we'll set our, uh, our white balance to either auto or daylight. You can use either one. Uh, daylight is a little more correct, but either one will work. So you'll have a button named WB on this camera. It's here on the back next to the display. We'll press and hold that. And then uh, do the thumb wheel until we get the little sun lit. And then if there's, and we also want to make sure that the finger, that we uh, do the finger until we get zero. <clears throat> that gives us the daylight balance. And then we want our autofocus on. So on these cameras, there's two autofocus settings uh, to, to enable the autofocus. There's one on the body, and that's a little switch right here near the lens on the, what would be the left side as you're normally holding it. So near the bottom of the lens here, you have a little switch. We want to make sure that switch is showing AF for autofocus. And then there will also be a switch on the lens. Now some, the nomenclature may vary. It may be A and M. It may be A, A I'm sorry, it may be M slash A, or it may even say auto, depending on which lens you're using. We want to make sure that that is on, and then we also want to make sure our optical image stabilization is turned on as well. On this lens, this is a Nikon lens, it's called VR for vibration reduction. So we want to make sure that is also turned on. And then lastly, we want to make sure that the diopter is set for our eyesight. There's a lot of people have different uh, glasses prescriptions, and so if somebody used it before you had a different prescription, this might not be set to a setting that's easy for you to see. So this is right here, right next to the eyepiece. And it's physically uh, adjusting the magnification, or the focus rather, of the eyepiece. So what we want to do, what I usually do is slightly depress the shutter release. And then that lights up that little uh, row of text across the bottom. And then I can use that wheel as I'm looking through it and focus till I get a nice clear focus. And that just makes it a whole lot easier as you're flying your mission that when you, everything you're looking at, you see in focus. So that'll help out a lot. Those are the settings we want to use for a sunny day. If it's cloudy, we'll obviously need to let a little more light in. So, uh, or we want to increase the amplification of the sensor. And the way we do that, of course, is through ISO. So again, we'll press the ISO button, and then we can dial in up to ISO 800. If we go too much beyond 800, then we start losing our dynamic range, and we start introducing noise. So we want to keep it below the ISO below 800. 640 would be fine, too, if that works and well for your setup. If it's getting dark out, the only thing that we would then change is we could let our shutter speed go as low as one hundredth of a second, but you don't want to go any lower than that, even with image stabilization, because the, the airplane is moving. And so you can still get motion blur. You may not notice it right in the center, but the, the edges may have a little bit of motion blur. So you never want to go below a hundredth of a second. You never want to go above ISO 1600 because then that way you're just introducing too much noise or too much motion blur. If you can't make a good image with those settings, it's probably too dark and you need to uh, land and wait for the sun to come back up. The other settings that we need to set on our camera are the uh, JPEG quality. 
So there's a Qual, Q-U-A-L button on this camera. It's on the back, on the bottom there. We press and hold that button. And then we dial in uh, large, L. So there's large, medium, and small. We want L for large. And then we want to just dial this around until it says just fine. And then that gives us the highest quality compression and the largest possible number of pixels. We want to set our uh, shot setting for single shot. Now we have the S setting on the top of the dial, but on the bottom, on the skirt of the dial, there's also S and CL and CH. We want to be sure that that is set to S, and that gives us a single shot every time we press the shutter release. We want to use matrix metering. So that's our little matrix metering button here near the shutter release. Press and hold that, and then use the thumb wheel to go from single point to center weighted to matrix. And then we need to set up our exposure compensation. We want that set to zero. So that's right next to the matrix metering. Press and hold that. And just be sure we have 0.0. .0. And then we want to ensure that the camera has the maximum uh, autofocus capabilities. So we're going to press and hold the uh, this little autofocus switch here. It also has a button on it. So we're going to press and hold that button right there. And then we can use the thumb wheel to select AF-A. And then we can use our finger wheel to go from single point to nine points to, I think, 15 to 51, all the way up to auto, A-U-T-O. And that allows the camera to get our, our best focus. So those are the uh, primary settings that we want to set up our camera for. There's also one more uh, important one, and that is in the menus. Have to, there's not a button for it. You have to go into the menus. So press the menu button on this camera, it's on, right here on the back, and the uh, display will show our menu. And so we need to find the setup menu, so I'm going to press the left on the little rocker switch here. I'm going to press left and then use up and down to get to the setup menu. And then we'll press right, and then we'll press up and down to get to uh, GPS. And it just says GPS, and we'll press right again. And then there's a uh, setting called Use GPS to Set Camera Clock. Okay, we want to select that and press OK, and select Yes, and press OK. Then that way, when we put the GPS on the camera, and the sat it locks into the satellite, then the camera will set the time according to the satellite, which is extremely accurate. The other optional setting that you might want to do while we're here is to go into the shooting menu. So we'll go back out to the main menu by pressing left, and then go up to the shooting menu, and then go into the shooting menu, and then up and down until we get to active de-lighting. And what that allows a, the camera to do is to compress, slightly compress the highlights so that we maintain detail in the highlights. It's pretty important for most of what we're doing. So I recommend we select active de-lighting and then just select normal. Normal is good. And then when we have that, just press the menu button a couple of times until it goes blank and we have made our sets. So now we need to put on our GPS. So that goes on the hot shoe. I'm going to take off the hot shoe cover here. <clears throat> and here's our GPS unit. It's a Sol Meta. And that will slide right onto the, where the hot shoe is. It slides on there and unfortunately it doesn't lock, so you kind of have to be sure it stays on there. And then there will be a cable specific to your camera. There's two different types, and they just have to find the one that fits your camera. And there is a, a plug that obviously fits, and it only fits one way, into the side of the GPS. Plugs right in there. And then we'll open the little panel door down here and 
then this ca uh, cable end also only goes one way. There's a little uh, slot on it, and you can see there's a slot on the socket, and we'll just put those together. And then we'll press and hold the GPS until it turns on. It goes through a little self-test, and then it will eventually display the latitude and longitude. When it does that, it's ready to go. And then you'll also notice on your LCD that you now have a GPS enunciator turned on, indicator turned on. What I do at this point is I'll go out to the, physically walk out to the airplane and then just take one image of the back of the airplane. And then with that, I can see my lighting's okay. You know, the focus is working. You know, it's just a really good uh, check. And then, of course, it'll display the airplane on the back. And if I press the up and down, uh, what will happen is one of those pages will have an overlay of the GPS data. And so you can double check that GPS data and make sure that it's really your area. It should be. I don't see any reason it would never be, but uh, just a good sanity check. So now you've done all your pre-flight for the camera, and now you're ready to fly. So while you're flying, on, you're going to your first target, just relax. Because when you're in target, there's a lot of things that are happening very quickly, a lot of stress, and you're just going to do better if you just relax. You have your camera all set up. There's no reason to change anything on it. Just leave it and then wait until you get close to grid. Tell your pilot, let you know about five or 10 minutes before you get into grid. And then when you're getting close, then go ahead and turn the camera on, turn your GPS on, or you could leave them on. The, the batteries on these will last quite a long time. And then uh, as you fly each leg, you always wanna go back and double check by pressing the little playback button and scrolling through all of your photos that you've taken and make sure that they're not blown out and, and that they're in focus. I have a little device that I carry with me. It's called a Hoodman. And this is just, it's an eye loop. And what I can do then is put this over the back and this gives me a dark space where if I, I'm not getting any glare from anything and I can see in great detail everything I've done. And of course I can use the plus and the minus buttons on the back there to uh, also further magnify the image and make sure everything's in really good tight focus. When we're shooting, of course, first thing we're going to do is open a little port window. And it's usually on the left side behind the pilot. Sometimes it's on the right side, but uh, for what we're talking about here, it's always going to be on the left. And we want to keep the lens away from the wind because you're flying at 90 knots it's over 100 miles an hour and the wind blows in pretty hard and so you have to and as you're focusing sometimes the lens will you know uh, extend and you don't want to extend it right into the uh, the airstream because it'll start to vibrate so much and you'll get motion blur in your images so you just need to be sure you're not uh, no part of the lens is in that so in, in the uh, airstream, that's also a good reason to take the sunshade off because it will definitely catch some of that uh, wind. As we're shooting, we want to fill the frame at least 50%. We don't we don't want the target to be one little spot way out in the middle of the of the frame. It needs to fill the frame at least 50% up to 80%. We don't want to go. Too much bigger than that because we do want to leave a little bit of context and also you do kind of bounce around a little bit sometimes and it can be really hard to get it exactly centered but mainly we want it centered and at least 50 to 80 percent and if you can sometimes you can safely loosen your seat belt a little bit and it'll, it'll help you to maneuver better but if you need to sit back down again go ahead and tighten it back down for safety problems yeah, things happen while you're up there flying around. And this, is, this slide will help us to understand some of the things that we can do to help mitigate some problems that we may run into. 
One thing you can do is if the camera just kind of seems to be locked up, try turning it off. Turn off the GPS if you need to. Just let it sit for a second and turn it back on again and see if that helps. It, it really does sometimes. If that doesn't help, turn it off, back off again and um, take the battery out. Now you're going to have to take off the battery grip to get to the battery. So we got the battery grip off and then we can open a little battery port here on the bottom and then pop that battery out. And this is a hard reset. If anything, if the uh, computer inside the camera is locked up, this is going to unlock it for sure. So we put that back in, close the door, and then carefully put the uh, battery grip back on again. Lock that down. And then turn it on, see if everything's happy again. If that doesn't work, uh, the next thing you might want to try is a soft reset. Now on the exposure adjust button, there's a little green dot right next to it. And then on the quality button, there's also a, a green dot right next to that one. Press and hold those two buttons for a total of two seconds. And then the camera will reset. Now you, of course, you'll have to go back and then program in your uh, fire uh, shutter priority and 500th of a second and your ISO and any other settings you may need to take care of. But at least that'll put it into a soft reset mode and that takes care of just about everything. Now if you're still not able to get an image, the last thing you want to try is putting it into the little green auto mode. So we just turn on this camera, we just turn that around. Now not all cameras have the green auto mode, just to let you know. You may have one that doesn't have it. But it'll be a picture of a little camera, and it's in green, and it says auto, and it's in green. Just set it to that setting, and hopefully with that you can at least get something. Uh, another thing, uh, when it gets locked up, that I didn't mention, is to take the card out and then put it back in. Sometimes that'll, uh, you know, unlock the uh, card writing. If you find that happens a lot, you may need to update the firmware on your camera. Of course, that's a little beyond the scope of this pre-flight video. Other things that can happen when you get up there, like I say, anybody can get motion sickness. I've gotten it from time to time. I've known very experienced pilots that have also gotten motion sick while trying to do aerial photography. Because again, you're looking through the camera, you're looking at the back of it, you're looking down, and you just get disoriented. It happens to the best of us. Don't be embarrassed. Tell your pilot right away, hey, you know, I'm kind of not feeling so good. Let's go loiter for a while somewhere. Maybe I can start to feel better. Um, if that doesn't work, then, you know, uh, look out the, the horizon or just sit back and close your eyes. Just get a rest for a minute. Sip a little water, a little Gatorade. Just get your, uh, you know, might be a little bit dehydrated. So if you do start to feel better, Still give yourself a little bit more time, make sure that you're really going to feel better, and then go fly the rest of your mission. Otherwise, return to base. It, again, it happens to everybody, so don't, don't feel like you have to be a hero. But do have your Ziploc bags ready just in case. Now, after we land, after we return to base, now we need to get these images that we've put a lot of blood, sweat, toil, and tears into. We need to make sure that they're backed up, either with a customer or on a local computer. And what I highly recommend is to not use the camera to copy files. Use a, an external card reader. So just take the card out, put it in your card reader, or if you have some uh, mission staff assistant there that can handle that for you, make sure that they get those, all those files copied somewhere and preferably backed up again to some other place. And then you're ready to format the card once it's backed up in at least two places. I highly recommend that. You've gotten everything uploaded, you're ready to go. Now it's time to replenish, kind of uh, refit, repair, and, and rest. Because chances are we'll have another mission right away and you need to be rested up for that. You don't want to wear yourself out. So we talked about getting your memory card uploaded. After it's been uploaded and the data is, is either at, safely at the customers or we have it in at least two places, 
then what we what we want to do is format our card. We always want to keep it formatted in the uh, camera. We read it somewhere else, but we format it in the camera. Recharge those batteries as quick as you can get the uh, recharge the batteries out. Get them into a recharger. These batteries in the newer cameras will last a very long time because the newer cameras have a CMOS sensor and the CMOS uses much less energy. Now clean the lens if you need to. Take a look at it. Um, I carry a little blower with me. I can blow off any dust that gets on there. I can also you know, give it just a little bit of a, a puff with my uh, lips. If I get a, a something, you know, a fingerprint or there's something that's really bad on the lens, don't use a paper towel or a Kleenex. Either use a paper that's specifically designed to be used for cleaning lenses. There's also uh, some manufact other manufacturers that have nice little rags that you can use to wipe. Worst case, use a clean handkerchief, but always clean wet. Uh, either use some drops on there that, that are designed for cleaning lens or give it some uh, fog. And then we clean from the center and we work our way out. And that pr pushes the dirt out of the middle of the lens. And then if we leave any lint on there, we'll just give it a quick blast. Get everything nice and clean for the next time that we're going to shoot. Of course, a good way to keep Fingerprints off your lens is keep that lens cap on whenever you're not actually taking photos. So the air crew must work as a team. It's very important that we create the highest quality photos that we can. It's not just about quantity, it's about getting quality photos. And safety and time are of the essence.